Reconnaissance is where it all begins. Previously, the best you could achieve was climbing the rigging of an old ship, going up the mast, looking from the crow's nest, and trying to look over the horizon. By 1908, 1909, the Navy were using kites and balloons to try and extend the height of that crow's nest and that mast further still. With the arrival of the aircraft, it now gave them the possibility not only to gain height and look over the horizon, but actually move away from the ship and rove around and explore several miles away from the ship and then bring back all of that information, all of that reconnaissance information and use it for best tactical advantage. Even before World War I, the British Navy experimented with ground-based aircraft in order to accommodate them for use as shipborne aviation. Aircraft would take off from a basic takeoff platform installed atop the bow gun turret or forecastle. They managed to take off, but until a certain time, no one was able to land an aircraft on a moving ship. Squadron Commander Edwin Dunning achieved this in August 1917 with an experiment to see if he could land back onto HMS Furious whilst Furious was moving and underway at sea. To do this, he had to fly down the port side of the ship, past the superstructure, past the funnels, past all of the masting, and at the very last moment, maneuver his aircraft very dangerously in front of the, the, the island and tower and drop it onto the very short deck on the front of the ship. This was the very first time that an aircraft had actually landed on a ship moving at sea, and it's made an enormous step forward in the possibility of creating what would become the aircraft carrier. However, a maneuver like this was an exception. Only the best pilots were able to land their aircraft on a cruiser or battleship. For this reason, in the first 20 years of the 20th century, the role of naval aviation was fulfilled by seaplanes equipped with floats, allowing them to land on water. They were launched from specially equipped vessels. The seaplane lighter was another key part of carrier development. The seaplane lighter was a large steel hollow hulled barge that was originally designed to tow flying boats many, many miles further than their flying range and of course extend their flying distance. They could be towed behind a destroyer or a fast launch and deliver that flying boat anywhere that, that the Navy needed to operate it. In two decades, seaplanes evolved from a fragile flying apparatus to a reliable machine, able to withstand significant accelerations. The aircraft behind me first came into service in 1935. It was built initially to fulfil a requirement from the Australians who wanted 12 aircraft to operate from various ships that they had. But it was designed by a chap called RJ Mitchell who worked for Supermarine. And RJ Mitchell, as many of you will know, was the gentleman who designed the Spitfire. And one of the things that surprised both RJ Mitchell was at the SBAC, that's Society of British Aerospace Companies Air Show, which then took place, I believe, in Hendon in the 1930s, the test pilot actually looped this aircraft, which surprised the designer, but it was able to, under, to withstand the pressures or the, the stresses and strains simply because it had been built so very strongly. Supermarine Walrus specifications. Length, 11 and a half meters. Wingspan, almost 14 meters. Maximum takeoff weight, 3,651 kilograms. Engine, Bristol Pegasus 6, 680 horsepower. Maximum speed, 217 kilometers per hour at a height of 1,450 meters. Armament, two 3 by 7.7 .7 millimeter Vickers or Lewis machine gun. Payload, 272 kilograms of bombs. Crew, three people. Shipborne aviation continued to evolve, and the range of tasks it could perform became larger, not only to spot an enemy in time, but also deliver a precise and powerful strike on them. Ferry aviation have been manufacturing aircraft for the Admiralty and for the Royal Navy from the end of World War I. 
Ferry developed its own aircraft as a, as a self-financed project called the TR, TSR-1 in the early 1930s. This developed into the TSR-2, which the Admiralty saw and liked and adopted and soon became known as the Swordfish. Ferry Swordfish specifications. Length, 11 meters. Wingspan, almost 14 meters. Maximum takeoff weight, 4,036 kilograms. Engine, Bristol Pegasus 3M, 690 horsepower. Maximum speed, 222 kilometers per hour. Armament, one 7.7 millimeter Vickers machine gun. One 7.7 millimeter Vickers or Lewis machine gun in the rear cockpit. Payload, three 227 kilogram bombs. Torpedo, 702 kilograms. It was not until after the war that the air arm of the Royal Navy received a new aircraft. When batch production of the Westland Wyvern began, it was able to play the role of both an attack and fighter plane. Specifications of the carrier-borne fighter Westland Wyvern S4. Length, almost 12 meters. Wingspan, 13 and a half meters. Maximum takeoff weight, 11,115 kilograms. Engine, turboprop, Armstrong Siddeley Python 3, 3,670 horsepower. Maximum speed, 615 kilometers per hour at a height of 3,000 meters. It wasn't until May 1940 that the British Navy received a modern carrier-borne fighter aircraft, the Ferry Fulmer. The Ferry Aviation Company produced 600 vehicles before the end of 1942. The Ferry Fulmar is the first stress skin, all metal monoplane fighter that the Navy had specifically built and ordered for it. The Fulmar, as a name, as a, as a graceful bird, a beautiful sea bird that is extremely agile uh, and, and is, is, is a beautiful, um, almost an acrobatic flying gull. Specifications of the Ferry Fulmer carrier-borne fighter plane. Length, over 12 meters. Wingspan, over 14 meters. Maximum takeoff weight, 4,944 kilograms. Engine, Rolls-Royce Merlin 30, 1,300 horsepower. Maximum speed, 426 kilometers per hour at a height of 3,000 meters. Armament, eight 7.7 millimeter Browning machine guns. Payload, eight 11 kilogram bombs under the wings. Crew, two people. There's the pilot, of course, at the front, and again, an observer stroke navigator in the rear compartment. This is essential again for navigating across open sea, where there are very, very few landmarks or reference marks to get the aircraft safely back to the, the aircraft carrier. The observer, situated in the rear cockpit, would have to be constantly taking plotting details to track their course away from the ship and, of course, back to the ship safely to recover, with the ship not being in the same position as when they left it. The aircraft was too big for a fighter plane and had insufficient speed. In addition, the crew faced considerable difficulties when their vehicle was shot down and they needed to leave it as quickly as possible. In this case, the high location of the tailplane posed serious danger. Firstly, they have to get the aircraft cockpit open, which slides back, but only that far. So now the pilot has to unbuckle himself, get himself out into the slipstream of, of, of the aircraft, which is possibly as much as 150 to 200 miles an hour. And then, whilst being buffeted by that wind and slipstream, has to get himself out onto the wing and jump through the gap between the main plane and the tail plane. Now the critical thing there is the tail plane is not going to wait for him to go through the gap. The, the tail plane is still coming forwards at 200 miles an hour. It was even more difficult to leave the aircraft for the navigator. If the cabin was ablaze and the pilot had already bailed out or was wounded, the vehicle could enter an uncontrolled spin, and the navigator's odds for escape were slim to none. 
Fortunately, there are very few recorded problems other than getting out, because adrenaline works wonders. If you have to get out, you'll do things you normally cannot achieve. Regardless of all the Fulmer's shortcomings, it received an enthusiastic welcome in the Royal Navy. For nine months, World War II ravaged Europe, and the new fighter plane could not have come at a better time. It took part in uh, air cover support for uh, work in the Mediterranean and the defense of Malta, uh, as well as doing reconnaissance, fighter reconnaissance work for the Bismarck raid ahead of the Swordfish and also for the Battle of Taranto, again in the Mediterranean. From March 1941, the British Royal Navy began to receive U.S. carrier-borne aircraft under the Lend-Lease policy, a program under which the U.S. supplied its allies with everything necessary to support their war efforts. At the same time, Great Britain continued to design and create their own aircraft. Because we have limited resources compared with America, we design airplanes that can do more than one task. They're designed for a specific task, but they're adapted to do others. The Royal Air Force performed excellently during the Battle of Britain. Even the Hurricane, which was quite obsolete compared to the German Messerschmitt and inferior to it in terms of specifications. It was still a good and reliable fighter plane, which pretty much allowed them to defend Britain. And in wartime, under the conditions of limited funds and resources, they just took this Hurricane and rebuilt it to be used as a carrier-borne plane. However, when Allies got closer to the enemy shore, so to speak, that's when they needed a more reliable fighter. Again, they took a land-based aircraft, the Spitfire, and upgraded it to be used from carriers under a new name, the Seafire. Specifications of the Supermarine Seafire F Mark 17 carrier-borne fighter. Length, 10 meters. Wingspan, over 11 meters. Maximum takeoff weight, 4,300 kilograms. Engine, Rolls-Royce Griffin 6, 1,850 horsepower. Maximum speed, 636 kilometers per hour at a height of 3,900 meters. Armament, two 20 millimeter Hispano Mark V cannons, four 7.7 millimeter Browning machine guns. Payload, one 227 kilogram bomb under the fuselage or two 114 kilogram bombs under wings and a suspended fuel tank under the fuselage. Unguided rockets, eight RP-3 rockets. Crew, one person. Specifications of the Fairy Firefly FR-1 carrier-borne fighter. Length, over 11 meters. Wingspan, over 13 meters. Maximum takeoff weight, 6,759 kilograms. Engine, Rolls-Royce Griffin 2B, 1,735 horsepower. Maximum speed, 509 kilometers per hour at a height of 5,200 meters. Armament, 420 Hispano Suiza Mark II cannons in wings. Payload, two 454 kilogram or 227 kilogram under wings. RP-3 unguided rockets. Crew, two people. Specifications of the Hawker Sea Fury FB Mark 11 carrier borne fighter plane. Length, over 10.5 meters. Maximum takeoff weight, 6,522 kilograms. Wingspan, almost 12 meters. Maximum speed, 724 kilometers per hour at a height of 6,100 meters. Engine, Bristol Centaurus 18, 2,560 horsepower. Armament, four 20 millimeter Hispano Mark V cannons. Unguided rockets, up to 12 RP-3 rockets. Payload, up to 907 kilograms. Crew, one person. Usually, the Sea Furies were launched with the help of a hydraulic catapult, because carrier's flight decks were too short for it to gain the necessary speed and take off with a full payload. If there was a catapult malfunction, additional rocket thrusters had to be used. These were mounted under the wings and activated by electrical ignition. Sadly, often that didn't happen, they went over the side. And there are two known cases of airplane going over the front when the Raytog kit didn't work at all, and the pilot sitting in the cockpit watching the airplane go over, sorry, the ship go overhead before he decided to get out and get himself rescued by the attendant destroyer.
However, the service run of the Sea Fury was quite short. Engineers were already working on modern jet engines. New technologies allowed them to improve airplane dynamics, the system for flight control, and make vehicles more powerful and maneuverable. A new age of deck aviation began.